Okay, what's going on, everybody? It's uh, Justin, and I got Richard here with me. We're going to chat today about uh, really was going to start out as kind of a battle, and it extrapolated into something a lot more than that. And the conversation today is tides versus no tides, areas with no tides. I, uh, I live in central Florida, and I fish an area that doesn't have really any tidal movement most of the time. A lot of it is wind driven uh, over in Mosquito Lagoon and Indian River. And my buddy Richard here fishes an area uh, up in Northeast Florida and he gets like six foot tide swings. And I mean, that's that's a lot, but there's areas what are, you know around the Florida Georgia line and South Carolina that can get eight, eight and a half foot tide swings, like just oh, yeah. crazy tidal movement. And, um, and we kind of wanted to just hash it out today and talk about from a pre-planning standpoint in preparation for any trip that we do, how do we approach areas based on tides? You know, depending on the species and the time of the year, do we want to fish a high tide? Do we want to fish a low tide? Do we want to fish slack? Are there advantages to not to fishing an area without any tide, which I think there are, and I'm going to kind of go into that here in this video, but um, you know, Richard, I kind of want you to take it away, man. You uh, you run the gamut up there in, in Northeast Florida. I've seen a couple of your videos lately, and I'm I'm pretty impressed. I'm looking forward to coming up and fishing with you here soon. But uh, you know, take it away. Talk to us a little bit about in your pre plan. You know, because most areas that people are going to fish are going to be tidal dependent. Whether it's a two and a half, three foot tide swing, or it's six, seven foot plus. And we're coming up on a big moon phase here soon, so I know it's probably going to be a little bit higher than normal. What are the things that go through your mind when you're trying to prepare for a trip? Yeah. So, you know, the, really the first thing I think about, you know, before I even start planning my trip is the tide. I mean, that's probably the number one thing I think about. It's the number one thing I look at before I even choose an area sometimes, you know. So I look at the tide and I see what part of the tide cycle I'm going to be fishing. Uh, that day. And what I also like to look at is, you know, as we know, with full moons and things like that, you know, that increases um, a lot of your flow, which can change, you know, how your approach or what time of the tide cycle you're going to fish. You know, for example, um, you know, like right now we're going into a full moon, we're about to have a six foot, like I think a six one uh, this weekend, which is very, very high for this area. Um, you know, true flood tide. So one of the things, if you're going to be fishing that area and you're not actually fishing the flood, you know, what you're going to want to focus on are going to be kind of those, you know, top thirds and lower thirds of the tide, you know, and really the reason you want to think about that is because there actually is a thing as too much water movement. Um, and on sometimes when we get these huge tides coming in and uh, you know, around the full moon, that middle part, you know, of the tide cycle is just ripping. I mean, it is crazy. And so what you can do is kind of focus on that lower third of the tide and then the top third. So the way I kind of like to, you know, think about it really is if you imagine a train, you know, a train takes a little while to kind of get up and run and, you know, example, coming out of a low slack tide. So it's not quite, you know, really just going off the tracks yet. So it's really starting to build up. And when you have those really big tides, that's where I like to focus, you know, but then on the other weeks, you know, um, when it's coming in, I actually like to focus a little bit more of when it's going to be more of a tide. Um, so I will focus and shift a little bit more to that middle portion, especially if it's going to be anywhere in the middle of the day and it's still pretty warm uh, water temperature wise, that's going to make those fish feed a lot better. Um, so that's a couple of things I like to look at when it comes to tides in general. So I, I feel like I kind of understand it when you say lower third and top third of a tide that like, let's say the tides incoming and the top of high tide where the water is as high as it can be is at 12 in the afternoon. Okay. What, what do you mean for top third and low and bottom third of tides? Like what are truly those sweet times if hypothetically a high tides at 12? Yeah, exactly. So you got six hours typically, you know, ish, um, depending on wind and things like that, which we'll talk about in a minute, too, because that really does make a big difference as well. Um, so, you know, back off two hours, that's going to be roughly that top third. So if 12 o'clock is high tide, you know, around 10 o'clock is really when I'm going to want to really, really focus and be fishing hard. 
um, you know, or if you can go any earlier, same thing on the bottom side, you know, and then the same thing once you hit that peak and you start to go back down those first two hours, two and a half hours are probably going to be a little bit better because after that, man, that water is really going to start moving pretty fast. Um, you know, and it's not that fish aren't feeding necessarily, but it's a lot more difficult from a maneuverability standpoint. Um, and I mean, just a lot of different things. And those fish have to be close to structure as well, which um, we can start talking about that a little bit um, if you want for this area, that, because that's kind of the second thing that I start to look at, too. One thing that I'm curious about is, you know, even though I fish areas that don't have really any tidal movement, the times that I do go fish parts of Tampa Bay, um, moving into when it gets a little bit cooler, I do start fishing St. Augustine, Northeast parts of Florida, um, sometimes Southwest Florida when it's super cold and we have, I'll, I'll get into that in a minute, but there's a negative tide. doesn't matter whether it's high or it's low, it's negative like 0.8 feet. <laughs> so, yeah. it, you know, it's just bone dry in a lot of areas, which is kind of unique. We'll get into that. But for me, and I'm sure a lot of people out there, uh, you, you have had a lot of success catching redfish and trout and flounder and a lot of things on a higher tide. When that, when that water is at its highest point and you're talking that the, the top two thirds or the top third, the last two hours of the ingo, incoming tide, and then on that backside, the first two hours of the outgoing tide, where it kind of slows and peaks and then turns around again. When the water's at its highest, finding fish can be a pain in the butt. Uh, but you have figured it out. I mean, you, you, you came on and joined the team here at Salt Strong. And one of the first videos you came out with was, boom, this is how to go catch more fish on a high tide. And I was like, what? Like, I'm terrible at finding redfish and trout at a higher tide because they tend to, like you say, they're so structure oriented. They either move back up in the creeks or they scoot up underneath the mangroves. And yeah, you can skip up underneath there. Or you can soak a, you know, a cut piece of pinfish or a live bait underneath there and bait and wait but it's much, much harder. What do you do? And I, I guess let's, let's be specific on it because this is kind of the fun part. Like what lures would you want to throw on a higher tide that you feel that you've had more success with and why? Yeah, exactly. So the first thing, you know, that I really think about is what type of bait are the fish going after during that part of the tide cycle? And when you think of it, around my area, you know, you think about water really pushing up into the grass, over those big oyster rakes, all of that stuff. Um, so kind of what I've seen that fish are really keying in on um, and lures that I will always have tied on for high tide situation. Um, I'll tell you, this is probably my favorite right here, the five inch jerk bait, the Alabama leprechaun, just on a weighted hook. Um, but you'll see with all these lures I have also have the 2.0 and then another really good favorite for covering a ton of water and being able to just not get hung up is going to be a, just a gold spoon or aqua dream. I like the white as well, but, um, they're all going to be weedless because everywhere that I'm throwing is almost always going to be in the grass coming out, you know, and really that three feet off of the the really the first bit of grass where it starts to kind of taper off anything past that most of those fish aren't there anymore they are pushed up right there on the edge so another thing that you've seen uh with these lures here like these are not heavy weights this is an eighth of an ounce which fishing the heavy currents and stuff over here a lot of times this just doesn't get it done sometimes you'll need a quarter sometimes even heavier but on those higher tides you know you're usually fishing you know less than two feet of water in the area that that fish is going to be, you know, especially with redfish. A lot of times I just go up to a grass line in an area that I know is going to have a good flat next to it. And I'll just listen. And if you listen, you will hear these fish. Sometimes they're 10 or 15 feet into the grass. Um, so I, and I've actually caught them just like that, especially with the spoon and a, a Alabama leprechaun, you know, just being able to throw it in there and slide that through the grass, they're going to pick it up. Um, and the other thing I like about high tide fishing, um, you know, those fish are a lot more comfortable. Yes, it, there's a whole lot more water. You got to find them. But when you do, 
they're turned on and they're ready to eat because it's going to take a whole nother tide cycle before that same food is available again because that all that water is rushing out and that's going to be dry land so that's definitely something that you know you can kind of use to your advantage you know you might have to cover a little bit of water but you know th those fish are going to be turned on i feel like i i take for granted a lot of times in my pre-planning uh, i had a recent trip over to ozello uh, it's not really the bend of Florida, but it's still the northwest part of Florida before you get to the panhandle. And um, the tide swings can be three, three and a half feet. You know, that, that's, that tends to be about average. It's not crazy, but I looked at the tides in my pre-plan and it said it was going to be a low tide. I get out there. Uh, it's supposed to be low tide at 930. And I didn't do two things. So hindsight being 2020, I didn't look to see how low that low tide was and even though it said low tide and it said that you know there was going to be a, a better time period of that bite's going to happen in the in the you know that that top or bottom third of the tide that you're talking about i get out there and the water was still super high <laughs> on a low tide yeah. and it was really frustrating because then i had from 9 nine thirty onward the water just kept coming in and in and in and with more and more water, it gets harder to isolate areas that, you know, these redfish and snook are going to go. And one thing that I take for granted, and if I were to look back and think about it, just a tip for everybody out there, is to, in your pre-planning, if you know that you're going to be out there for any period of time where the tide's coming in, and there's already going to be a substantial amount of water. I think that low tide was still a 1.7. Like, it was still pretty deep. It wasn't like a 0.4 or a 0.5 like that would be a, that would be much much lower and uh and i didn't i wasn't cognizant of knowing uh, on that lower tide still the water was going to be pretty high but as the water comes up i struggled you know i would fish these uh, you know these points where the current and the wind would come around and i'd bounce a slam shady on a jig head around those points in deeper water in four five six feet of water and for that area i i wasn't that was kind of out of my comfort zone. Like I did end up getting two small redfish. That was cool. But I've had days out there where I just see 27, 30 inch redfish here and here and here and they're tailing and they're, there's twos and threes moving together and they're popping bait on the shoreline. But the tides are a little more stable. They get a little bit lower. And at the bottom of that low tide, when it starts to creep up, those flats that I normally fish will have water starting to push up onto them and the fish will move in with them. And with that same concept, something that here I'm trying to get to my point, the areas that don't normally have water, okay, if you, uh, for the day that I went out on that low tide, it's still pretty high. As the water started to come up, there were these bays and coves and areas that are normally really, really shallow and inaccessible for a boat or a kayak. Anybody can get into these little coves and creek mouths, but when the, when the tide is low, normally, like a 0 0.5, 0 0.6 dead low tide, you can't get in there. There's no water at all. And if I were to go back and do it again, I would be cognizant of number one, know exactly how high and how low the water height is going to be for the area that you're fishing. And number two, if you're going to have areas where the water is coming up and getting higher, you're right, Richard, like you're fishing these grass edges where the water is creeping up to the grass and the redfish and the trout and things are going to move up there with it. You're going to throw lure presentations that are going to mimic the bait that's going to be available because water is flooding areas that it doesn't normally have access to. So it might seem challenging because there's more water, but you found ways to isolate things to look for on a higher tide. And now I'm thinking like, oh my gosh, I could just go back and isolate these coves that are normally bone dry and move up with that water. I'm so used to fishing open, expansive grass flats and points and, and drop-offs and potholes that it makes me, I mean, I'm learning something here. Like I definitely need to take that practice or that mindset and apply it if I ever get it stuck in a situation with too high of water. That's, that's genius. Like I love it. Um, yeah. And you made a point too earlier that we haven't really discussed yet, but wind, I mean, like how crucial that is. I mean, I guarantee that was probably, you know, a, a factor where, where you went fishing and that caused that higher water as well. 
Um, so I know what it does kind of for me over here, like example, I said, we're about to have a 6.1 because it's going to be a full moon and we've got like a northeast and east wind coming in, which it will be on the east coast is going to push even more water in. And it's been consistent like that over the last few days. So that's always something I'll look at as well. But like in areas, you know, like that, Justin, you know, kind of where you're at. I mean, what what are you thinking about, you know, specifically, you know, looking into the wind and how that's going to affect, you know, either where you go, bait, water movement, stuff like that. For areas with tide or without tide? Let's do without, kind of in the oh. low, lower areas, yeah. Okay, so, you know, thinking of a couple areas that, for, there's a lot of people that travel into the winter months, a lot of guys that are coming from up north are going to come down to Florida, and they're going to poke around you know, parts of central West coast, Southwest coast, and there's a little bit of tide movement, three feet or so. Um, but the guys that head to central Florida or that do make their time to go fish Mosquito Lagoon, Indian river, uh, Guana dam, the Guana preserve, which is, I think it's North of St. Augustine. Right. And it's South of Jacksonville. It's kind of like yeah. this little pocket. Then there's guys over in Texas that fish Baffin Bay. I know that that doesn't have a whole lot of tidal movement, if any, and for areas that don't have tidal movement, Wind is definitely the biggest thing that I'm looking at. So if let's take the East Coast, for example, I'm actually going to screen share uh, if I can. And I'm going to pull up. Oh, that's Baffin Bay. We'll come back to that here in a little bit. We were taking a look at that before the call to talk about the similarities to the area. So if you guys can see this fishing Indian River, the entire Indian River system, which I consider all of this North Indian River all the way down. We've got Port Canaveral right here, but there's a lock system that is just manually open and closed for boats to, you know, traverse through. And because it's always closed, there isn't a natural tidal flow through, through these areas. That's Banana River, North Indian River, and Mosquito Lagoon. And here on the east coast of Florida, anything that you fish, for the most part, is where you decide to fish is going to be based on wind direction. So a lot of these, as you can see, are open, expansive flats. You used to have a lot of seagrass. All that area that's sand right now used to all be seagrass. But there really isn't a whole lot of change in the depth. A lot of these sand flats you see out here is two feet, two feet, two feet, two feet, maybe one and a half as you get up close to the island. And it's nothing but expansive flats for miles and miles and miles. And there's this little canal here, and I'm sure in other areas that don't have a whole lot of tidal movement are going to have something very similar. This little canal here is called Hullover Canal. And this is the only area that you're ever really going to notice, at least here in the majority of Mosquito Lagoon and the North Indian River, that you're going to notice any kind of water flow. And a lot of that is going to be determined on the wind direction. So if you have a strong east wind, it's going to push a lot of the water that's here in the in Mosquito Lagoon through the canal and into Indian River. And that does change the water height a little bit on the Indian River side. And the same, if you have a, a north wind, there's not a whole lot of water down here from the south, okay? So if you have a north wind and it's pushing all this water down, it's gotta go somewhere. It's gonna come right through this canal system and move from the lagoon to the river. And the water height's gonna get a little bit higher. And this in, inherently is gonna drop a little bit. I mean, we're talking, six inches, maybe no more than a foot max in most situations. And the same, consequently, if you have a south wind, it's going to move all this water here from the South River into the lagoon and areas that, you know, might otherwise be very, very shallow or dry are now going to have access to a little more water, six inches or a foot. And you can poke back further into areas where, you know, redfish and trout don't normally get to explore and they may, you know, may be able to find a food source. They're like, hey, I haven't been able to enjoy this type of crab before. <laughs> the water doesn't normally get that high. Um, but for me, in my pre-trip planning, I'm trying to get out of the wind in, in areas like this. And I want to pull up Baffin Bay here in a second. As you can see, there's not a whole lot of winding creeks. There's not a lot of areas to escape out of the wind unless you tuck up behind these shorelines and spoil islands and things of that sort. Uh, if I come down into the river, I mean, this entire western edge shoreline of North Indian River is just flats. So obviously, 
with a strong east wind, 10 miles an hour, this is not going to be my most favorite place to fish. This is not going to be fun. Probably going to churn up the water a good bit. Won't really be able to have any sight fishing opportunities. I'm likely going to fish the, the shoreline that's going to have the most protection from the wind. But in talking about tides and in talking about water height, one thing that I've spent some time doing and looking at is with that wind direction, with that strong wind change, I'll fish areas that might not have a lot of water or might gain a little more water based on that wind direction and intensity. So like I mentioned, with a south wind and it pushes all the water from the river to the lagoon, I will poke around areas in Mosquito Lagoon. One in particular would be, you know, Cucumber Island, Redfish Flats up here in all of this backcountry area. It's really, really shallow, like bumping the bottom of my kayak shallow in a lot of situations. But if I have a really strong south wind for one, two or three days and it's just dumping water into the lagoon, this might be an area that I want to check out because it doesn't normally have a foot and a half of water in it. And after a day or two, when these fish get settled in and they push back and explore this area, they're going to get comfy and you're likely going to find fish that are super happy and have not been touched by anybody. Um, just, just a unique thing to consider for areas that don't, they don't have the consistent three feet up, three feet down, or in your case, six feet up, six feet down every six hours. Um, you know, but if, but if we have pretty stable conditions, the coolest thing about fishing areas that don't have uh, consistent tidal flow is that the fish can be very, very predictable. So, you know, I want to give an example. I want to zoom out, kind of go over to what we were talking about. Here's Corpus. I believe this is Baffin Bay. Okay. Yep. This is Baffin. So very similar to Mosquito Lagoon and Indian River. Uh, I want to try to be really specific with the situation. Let's say we're going to come into fall weather and we're not going to have but consistent five to 10 mile an hour winds. I think right now, Wyatt over in Texas is dealing with some storms. So that's going to kind of turn everything up or we are in a transition season. But when you have consistent weather and you have consistent patterns and there isn't that tidal flow coming up and down and, and causing these fish to feed or move, depending on what direction the tidal flow is going, you have fish that are going to sit up and they're likely going to do two things. They're either going to feed or they're going to move. Okay. And if you don't have anything that causes them to move, i.e. a dramatic change in weather, strong wind, you know, a big rainstorm, something like that, then let's say you have days where it's south wind, five miles an hour for five days. You can bet your sweet bippy, they're going to be fish all along this edge for days doing the same thing and potentially all day long because the consistency is going to keep these fish happy. All If there isn't tidal flow and the bait isn't coming in and out and in and out, the bait's just always going to be in the area, mud minnows, mullet, pinfish, croakers. If it's just going to be inundated with bait fish, there's really no reason for the predators to move. So they're likely going to gorge themselves until maybe the sun gets higher and they move from super shallow flats to a little bit deeper edge, just, just as an example. Um, so for you, Richard, you're kind of like, you're on the clock, like time's ticking and where you move and what you do has a lot to do with those sweet, like two to four hour periods around close to slack tide, whether it's high or low for me, you know, if you fish Baffin Bay or if I'm fishing Mosquito Lagoon, I can go out and be on fish from 6 a.m. to 12 p.m. Monday through Friday if I have the exact same weather conditions. So the thing that I try to look for is wind direction and wind intensity. Yeah, so I got a question. So you brought up a really good point, you know, for areas like this, you know, we're looking at Baffin Bay still right now. So would you say you're kind of looking for more zones and, you know, larger areas, so to speak, versus like where, where I look, you know, if I'm on satellite imagery, I'm looking at a specific oyster bar, I'm visualizing what part of the tide cycle I'm in, and I'm looking at exactly where that fish is going to be, you know, right behind that bar or something like that. Very, very specific because um, the fish are predictable when there is a lot of current. So, it, but it sounds like kind of what you were saying, you know, you can really pick out a zone, so to speak, because really wind is such a huge factor um, and structure too. Pretty much, man. If you don't mind, um, I want to 
But we talked a little bit about high tide and I'm talking a little bit about areas that don't have really much tidal movement at all. I kind of want you to screen share for a second and pull up just a general area in Northeast Florida of what you would look for on a lower tide. Like if, if you're going to have the last two hours of the bottom of the outgoing tide, the last two hours of outgoing tide and the first two hours of incoming tide, how would you go about it differently? You explained in your methodology, you're throwing Alabama leprechaun, throwing a jerk shad, you know, you're throwing a spoon and uh, I believe you had a slam shady 2.0. You're covering a lot of water for the most part on a higher tide. And then you might dissect some, you know, some grass edges as the water comes up, but on a lower tide, if you don't mind so that the audience, everybody here can see it in the tea time, um, sure. find an area that on a lower tide, this is what you would look for. And this is how you would target it differently than on a higher tide. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. See that okay? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Go All for right. it. Great, great. Yeah. So um, that's one thing that's great about uh, the Google here where you can actually go through um the historical data historical data is huge guys really really use that to your advantage see i'm kind of going through a few here let me see back in 1985 i'm trying to find a good oh, image here to hide, um so they can see these are tough these aren't very good ones here we go that's good awesome. low tide yeah yeah so all right, so yeah, kind of you want to start, uh, I guess, at like a lower part of the tide cycle, or where you? Yeah, let's to... let's kind of just reverse the situation. So, low tide is twelve o'clock, and let's say low tide for you is like 0. 0.5 or 0. 0.7 inches, like it's low, it's low, low. <laughs> yeah, like bump yeah. and bottom low. Right, right. Yeah, so um, at low tide, really, kind of the main thing that I'm looking for. Um, once again, use that historical imagery for areas like this, because you're going to be able to see where those deeper holes are. Um, so this is a pretty just good looking area right here, just off the of St. Mary's. So one, I like it. it's got a ton of structure on it. But what really is cool um, is you've got several good bodies of water right here all coming in. And this just think of this as a huge flat, like where we were just looking at. Think of this like that. But you can see all this right now at low tide. This is all dry. But if we went to a different image, look at that. I mean, that water is completely covering. Now, you might not be able to navigate all of it. However, look again and you see where the troughs are. You see where those kind of feeder creeks are coming in and out um, onto this flat. So at low tide, this is exactly the type of areas I like to look at. So this is a, probably a pretty deep bend right here. So at a lower portion of the tide, you know, especially a slack tide, I guarantee you there's probably a lot of fish that stack up in these bends and these deeper holes right here. And all they're doing is waiting for that water to get pushed back in and then they're going to feed in all with that water and they're going to come in and they're going to get access to all that food again. They've got plenty of structure. Um, and it's just, it's a perfect feeding zone for them and stuff like this. So. So I, I like that cut. Well, I mean, in general, the historical data is crazy to just look and you're like, you see this area? And I'm like, yeah, you, it's not traversable. <laughs> like, unless yeah. you got a, a shallow water craft, it might be hard to get into that area. And then you showed a different part of the tide where the water's much, much higher and it's all flooded. And yep. if you come out there and the water's flooded and you're, and you're not already familiar in your pre-trip planning of what that's going to look like, then you won't know how to fish it effectively. It's just going to seem like a lot of water. So that's that's awesome. Yeah, that's yeah. definitely needed for for what you're doing in your crazy tide swings. You definitely need to find where are the oysters, where are the deeper creeks. Because I mean, if this is all flooded, you can't really discern the little bit darker water as being the deeper areas. You know, and I mean, right there, like looking at this lower tide, you can kind of see all your points. Exactly. Yep. So, you know, this right here, I would really think heavily for trout, you know, somewhere around in here, you know, but then I love seeing areas like this. So right here is, it's a flat, a mud flat, and it's completely dry right here at low tide. But 
right here, this is what I just call an escape route. So this places like this are going to be phenomenal, especially for redfish. And a lot of times you're really big trout as well. Like those gators, they love getting in areas like this because you've got some oysters. Um, you know, there's some structure for them, but really, I mean, they push on to this as soon as they can get on there. There's fiddlers here, finger mullet, um, shrimp, I mean, everything, you know, and all that bait's going to try and get up in all these little fear creeks. Let's go back to another high tide image. See that water, I mean, it's all the way in, in here. It's, it's crazy, That's but so those crazy. fish, I mean, they just patrol this and sometimes the reds, they'll even get way up in here. Um, you know, if you're in a kayak or something, you can get pretty skinny and you will be surprised. You know, this is, you know, people talk about seeing them with their eyeballs, you know, out of the water, you know, this is the type of places that they do it. Um, so I love seeing edges in places like this. And right here is another really good one. Um, when that water is coming and rushing in, this is a perfect little ambush point, um, you know, where those fish can go because that bait's going to be getting pushed around. Um, and those fish aren't going to be moving that much, you know, they don't have to, all the food's going to be coming in to them, you know, so that's another thing as well. You don't have to go and necessarily search, um, as much as you would on a higher tide because there's only so many places for them to go, but they're going to be in those strategic locations where food's going to pass by them. They don't have to use a lot of energy and they can, you know, eat until that, that, uh, water gets pushed up on these flats. That's what I was going to say is, you know, for that lower part of the tide, you're not searching nearly as much. So you're likely dissecting and finding potentially pushes of redfish or trout blowing up on the shoreline or the very elusive uh, flounder backflip. Yeah. <laughs> they come yeah. up and, and hammer a mullet. I think that's so cool that that like yeah, flounder, that flounder will get up here, too. Yeah, I've, I have you, like breach out of the water. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah. it is Aladdin's flying carpet in real life. That's essentially like what it is. It, but, but to your point, you're more dissecting at this point than you are. Well, yeah. I mean, you're dissecting smaller areas. And I mean, I think that Alabama leprechaun would be the great crossover where you can slow down and pick apart fish. Um, one thing that I like about low tide fishing is it, it is so visual. Like it is so, um, I guess you kind of need to be a little more calculated in where you cast and why you cast there, because these fish are going to be in much shallower water. They're probably going to be a little bit on edge and you can't really plop a hamburger in front of their face. You need to lead fish. You need to very precisely hit points and bring them at a certain speed. Um, Cause you have just a lot, a lot less water to work with. Um, one thing that I can think of like recently you know, in uh, North River, North Indian River, I've been doing really well on, on good sized trout and kind of my go to when I fish over like for where you're at, you've got mud and you've got some oysters. And when the water is much lower and you can sight fish a little bit or at least make out silhouettes or make out pushes or where the baits congregated, you'll dissect. I've been a big fan of the power prawn. So <laughs> Uh, whether you rig it with a, a light jig head, like an eighth ounce or the weedless setup that we have, this is kind of my slowdown tool. So yes, on a higher tide, I think gold spoon, fantastic. I think slam shady bomber, um, you know, just on a weedless setup to just kind of, you know, hump around and, and cover a lot of water. That's, that's great. But as it gets much, much lower, I'll drop down my profile size to even, I mean, borderline the gold digger pinch the tail off and make it like a little fry it looks just like a mud minnow bouncing around or or like maybe a dark colored shrimp or just something that's that's not threatening you know it just looks like it's fleeing and it's really small profile and i kind of like that because it just seems like it's more finesse right you, you slow down a good bit um, as opposed to just covering all these points and drop-offs and edges where you're trying to find these fish sometimes this is more the scalpel of the time to fish. So personally, I like low tide fishing. You know, I, that's what I'm looking forward to doing later on on our trip. But uh, yeah. but I mean, other other than maybe a prawn or you know, like a jerk bait style, what else do you think would be kind of an underrated tool for fishing in low tide scenarios, like low water scenarios? Yeah, I mean, you actually just did a video on a, a really good one, uh, the chatterbait. Um, <laughs> like that, 
that's a pretty deadly tool. But when I think of low tide, you know, I will often even use a quarter ounce. Um, the reason why is the number one thing I want to do on a low tide is get close to the bottom when I'm fishing. Um, so if it's only, you know, yep, right there, that's a pretty cool setup with the Alabama leprechaun. Yeah. But, um, yeah, that's, that's really, you know, what I'm thinking about. I'm thinking about putting something that's heavy, that's going to get to the bottom and I'm putting it strategically into those deeper holes. Um, cause those fish, I mean, they're basically a lot of times they're not even feeding. They're really just kind of waiting for that tide to come back in. So a lot of times, you know, you're not trying to move really quick at low tide. You're, that's why I love using, you know, like a, a jerk bait or something like that, but I'll put a jig head on the front a lot of times and I'll just barely bump it along. Um, but you're in there with, it could be a school of 30 fish or 30 trout, reds, flounder, it could all be in that hole. Um, and you don't want to move it too fast because they are kind of spooky at low tide. Um, that's one thing I really enjoy about high tide as well is they're a little bit more comfortable. Um, and they're a lot, you know, more likely to feed in some cases, but that low tide, I mean, think it, it's, it can be fish in a barrel. You know, if you go into these deeper, deeper pockets, I mean, I've done a, a video about the weight fishing video I did on it. I had to move a hundred feet the whole day. I caught, I limited out on every fish, you know, that was there. So, um, that it can be some really, really good fishing, but that's really what I'm thinking about is, uh, something that will get to the bottom. Um, that could move slowly and still look pretty natural. So, yeah, that's, it's almost counterintuitive in the example that you gave, because you would think that in a low tide scenario, you'd want to get up on, on those mud flats that are normally have, you know, three, four, five feet of water are now in two foot or less of water and scalpel and dissect those mud flats and edges where the redfish are going to get up and the flounder are going to get up. But if it is a fish in a barrel situation and they are kind of in that bend example that you showed, then if you tried to dissect it with a small profile and for where you're at, it's pretty dirty water. You know, if that area on a higher tide is 10 feet and then now on the lower tide, it's four and everything else around it is borderline dry or just really shallow and the fish may not want to be shallow. If they're in this cut, you probably need a little bit bigger profile for them to acknowledge. So I, I do kind of like the chatterbait idea. I like the Alabama leprechaun on a jig head idea because, you know, poking down and bouncing into the holes and you're almost pretty much getting in front of their face. They're staying there because they feel safe. They're not eating, but if something's in their way and they're stuck, they, they might, might even eat out of pressure. You know, they might yeah. just yeah. instinctually just pop something and, and think about it later. Um, so I wanted to give, kind of a unique scenario for, for those people that are going to head down here in the winter months to Florida, specifically the Gulf Coast, let's say, you know, from the northwest to the southwest part of Florida, the main west part of Florida. Regardless in the winter time, whether you have an incoming or an outgoing tide, if you have a strong north wind, 10, 15, 20 miles an hour, or northeast, or strong east, really anything with a north wind would be ideal. It doesn't matter if you have a high tide at 10 a.m. in the morning and it's supposed to be 2.7 or 3.2. And it doesn't matter if the low tide is at four in the afternoon. Guess what? When you have a north wind like that, there ain't no tide. There is no water to be found. It is like someone pulled the drain out in the Gulf and and it's, it's one of my favorite times. You said fish in a barrel. It's one of my favorite times to go down and fish Pine Island Sound, Mat Lache, Cape Coral, Punta Gorda area, like Burnt Store on the east side. Um, just a, a lot of areas that like if I can find open expansive grass flats throughout three quarters of the year, I'll fish the lower parts of the tide. I'll find tailing redfish. I'll find redfish in potholes. And, and that's fun to me. It's visual. They're happy. They're moving around. But if I'm going to go out there and it's blowing 15 miles an hour out of the North, I'm not even worried about fishing the open expansive flats because there's no water. And yeah. what will happen is you'll find these deeper bowls that are normally three or four feet deep, maybe deeper, maybe five feet. And you get out onto the flat and you're like, okay, you know, high tide is going to be at 10. I'll move back. You get out there and you're like, Whoa, there's, there's no water. And in the kayak or in a shallow skiff or what have you, 
I can basically get up onto these areas that are bone dry. It's like I'm in a desert and portage over into this bowl that's maybe a foot and a half, two feet deep. And there's 30 redfish in it that are just playing like, you know, they're just ping ponging around everywhere in this bowl. And, and they're probably, you know, like, hey, I can't get out of here. And maybe they're not in a feeding mode, but they will still definitely eat. And it's kind of a, a cool experience. So yeah. for those of you out there that, that do head down to Florida in the wintertime, um, or anywhere on the Gulf Coast, that's something you need to keep in mind is that if you know if you're going to have a strong north or northeast wind and you are going to be in, you're doing your pre-trip planning and trying to figure out where to go, there's, there's a good chance there's not going to be any water. So I would spend some extra time finding those areas that look like it has deep water pockets and concentrate your efforts on those deep water pockets if you find out there's no water. <laughs> So just, just kind of a, a fun tip to keep in your back pocket. Yeah, absolutely. It, it's a really fun way to fish. And then, you know, also over here on the East Coast, if you've got more of a west wind, really similar situation. Yes, um, but it's going to be more of a, a negative tide. That water's still going to come back in. But if you get a, a really good negative tide, that same thing will happen. And you can even, you know, anchor your boat, get out and walk you know, into a creek or, or something like that, as long as it's got some sand and stuff. That's cool. I've never done it on the East Coast. I want to yeah, want to try that too. Yeah, if you guys get West Winds, I definitely want to head up there and, and check that out. Um, man, that's, we've covered a lot. And I know we, a lot of these are kind of going on a tangent, but we try to have like controlled chaos so that we can share with you guys what's on our mind and how we dissect and how we approach areas to be more successful. You know, these powwows that Richard and I have, this is kind of just captured in real time, but this is what we chat about all day long. And we chat with people that are in our insider membership over at saltstrong.com. So if you guys are not familiar with that, we are saltstrong. We are the largest inshore fishing club in America. And we're kind of a cool, unique operation because we teach people how to be better at inshore fishing, how to catch more inshore slams in less time. And you, you learn this by, there's lots of options. I mean, we have courses, we have an entire tackle shop page with all these lures and hooks and rigging methods that we, you know, we teach you guys how to put together, when to use them to maximize your efforts. But the biggest thing that we're trying to talk about here in a lot of these videos is that it's about trends. It's about finding where the fact that 90% of these fish are going to be in 10% of the water. That historical chart, I mean, we've gone over it before in previous videos, but nail on the head right there. I mean, the fact that you can look through and see different parts of the tides, that's so, I mean, sometimes I don't even think to do that. Now, in my pre-planning, if I just want to scoot up to you know, uh, Matanzas area, just a little bit south of St. Augustine, I'm going to look at that. I'm going to look at Long Creek and Pellissier and look at that historical data to determine what does it look like when it's super low and what does it look like when it's super high so that I know I can go out in six hours and catch two, three times as many fish than if I just went out there and, you know, fished blind. The whole goal here and what we teach a lot of our insider members is to cut that learning curve, right? Cut the frustration of going out and, and trying and struggling and failing. I mean, we've all been there. The whole point of the club is that Richard, myself, Joe and Luke, we've all had that time where we it was just a grind for, for many, many years. Sharing of information was kind of, eh, you know, you were tight-lipped mm -hmm. about stuff. And, and our community is all about helping anglers be more successful. It's anglers helping anglers. So on top of the fact that we have education, we have coaches like yourself, myself, Tony and Wyatt and Luke, we have a whole community of 25,000 plus people. I mean, it's growing fast of people that are sharing information with anywhere. I mean, from the Virginia coast, I mean, there's people up in the Jersey area all the way through Florida, Mississippi, Alabama, Texas, and anywhere in between people in, I talk to people in Ohio and Ohio and Arkansas and all over the U S um, and it's just really cool because it's, it's fun to know that we can share our experiences to help other people be more successful. And I'm learning new things in chatting with you. You know, I don't get to fish Northeast Florida all that often. So in doing this, this podcast or this, this kind of powwow session, I learned a lot from this myself 
Um, so, I mean, I, I still have a lot I need to learn too, but the things that we do know, we want to share with others to help everybody be more successful. So guys, you got to come check out SaltStrong. You got to check out our insider membership. We teach you guys how to cut that learning curve and to be a part of our family. So definitely head on over to saltstrong.com and uh, hopefully you'll bump into me and Richard on the water soon. Uh, thank you, man, for, for being on this call with me. This was, this was really cool. I'm looking forward to coming up and fishing with you this weekend. And I yeah. uh, hope, uh, hope we can get some good redfish and share that with you guys out there. Absolutely. It's going to be a blast. Good deal. Thank you, guys. We'll see you later. All right. See you guys. And if you're new to Salt Strong, just know that we're the best online fishing club in America because we literally guarantee that you'll start catching more fish in less time. And we do this by providing you with premium education, an exclusive online fishing community, and huge discounts on the best tackle for saltwater anglers. So to learn more, go to saltstrong.com, and we'll see you in the Insider Family soon.